organization affect or affects uh, Kerala uh, society, especially the backwaters, because Kerala is endowed with the uh, backwaters or blessed with the backwaters. And a major uh, feature of Kerala history and the culture is that the backwaters have molded the lifestyle of the people, their relations with the, uh, with the foreign countries, and to a certain extent, and to a certain extent, the uh, foreign trade and foreign relations, not in the modern sense of the diplomatic relations, the modern uh, foreign relations have shaped the history of Kerala. We don't know, uh, as it's usually it is said, it's from time immemorial, the Indian Ocean system has molded or shaped the history of Kerala because of its congenial climatic situation, the backwaters, numerous rivers flowing to the west and uh, uh, this, uh, joining with the sea and all of them, uh, most of them are ports in the uh, very remote past. And the Africans, Palestinians, Romans, Greeks, all foreigners have come here, settled here, trade relations with here, and then later developed into cultural relations. Here, Justin Matthew is uh, presenting a very strange or a very an interesting topic that is urbanization of backwaters, political ecology. That is his uh, streaming. I would like to congratulate him for say, framing such a uh, title, political ecology. And we are eager to hear him and. Uh, he practices history, the Delhi University, the College of Delhi University. And uh, with a great pleasure, I welcome Justin Matthew and all those who are witnessing this uh, uh, presentation of Justin Matthew on behalf of the KCHR. Once again, I welcome you all and uh, uh, request uh, with the chairman, Michael, Th Michael Sarandar is present. He is present. Is he present? Uh, he'll be joining any moment now, sir. Okay, okay. Then I straight away request uh, Justin Matthew to uh, start his presentation. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank Dr. you. Justin, could, uh, uh, yeah, Richard, could you, um, uh, would, you'd like to start your PowerPoint, sure. right? Or by that time, I believe yes. uh, the chairperson uh, yeah. would also be joining. All right, okay. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, we can wait for Thirgan, sir. There is no problem. Okay, yeah. By the time, if you could set up your presentation uh, also, yeah. That's All right. Fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Rachel, is that visible now? No, it's not visible. Just is it? Michael is invisible. You just say you start. I uh, no, Michael Kerrigan, sir, is just joining. He's starting his uh, PowerPoint presentation. Sir. Okay. The speaker is starting his PowerPoint. Justin, you have to uh, use the share screen option and. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yes, I'm doing that. Yes. Yeah. Now I think it should be <laughs> visible. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. right, okay. Yes. Uh, Professor Michael Tarragon has also joined us uh, now. Uh, Professor Michael Tarragon, may I request you to uh, kindly take over the proceeding? So Hello. Yes, sir. You're you're audible, sir. Uh, audible. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Justin uh, Matthew. Uh, welcome to this uh, academic gathering of the KCHR. Um, we are very happy 
uh, that you are sparing your time to uh, make a presentation on a topic which uh, to me personally is very very interesting uh, primarily because i am from the wembenard lake i i i, I live in a live in an island in this uh, uh, wembenard lake and um, it's only <clears throat> 22 kilometers away from the the city of Cochin, um, and the obvious link in terms of urbanizing tendencies over um, over a long period is basically a subject which is of uh, larger interest, uh, larger academic interest. Um, I'm uh, happy that you are. You will be talking about that. Um, only a point I would like to raise at the beginning of the seminar is that you know uh, I'm sure that there are people uh, who share my interest in the sense that a personal interest in terms of being familiar with this uh, terrain, uh, and also uh, this terrain. Uh, of course, uh, consists consist of uh, an estuary, and that is basically what is, um, which I suppose will be of interest to uh, your your uh, your academic interest too. The for more than uh, more than at least three centuries, this region was linked. Um, as an estuary from Cochin uh, in words. Uh, the beginning of that phenomena is, of course, not exactly clear, but geography, geographers would say that it is due to uh, upheaval in the, in the marine world in uh, 1341 or uh, around about that. Um, and it would have been feeded on by several other exciting episodes of different types, both natural as well as man-made. And I'm sure that you know the uh, uh, historical connection uh, goes from one polypurum in the in the in the north to another polypurum in the in the south, mm. and <clears throat> in between there are, as you know. Uh, and you not have to say it uh, or repeat it. Uh, there's a number of people, number of people of different castes, different communities, different persuasions, different occupations uh, live together. And uh, this kind of um, high density of population and pressure on both marine life as well as as well as uh, as well as on land makes this whole uh, region um, quite a complex as well as uh, as well as an exciting period of, of a field of study um, i'm sure that we would all be uh, we are all expecting uh, to listen to you and i'm sure that you would be uh, <coughs> delivering your lecture uh, Satisfying our curiosity, satisfying our, our expectations. Um, I once again welcome you. I once again uh, thank you for sparing your time to give this lecture. Uh, Dr. Justin Matthew. Okay, thank you, uh, <coughs> Professor Michael Tarajan. Thank you, uh, everyone, um, and good afternoon. Uh, uh, so, Professor Michael Tarajan made my task really easier by providing a really beautiful geographical and socio-political description of that, uh, the backwater region. So, you know, this would take me back to, you know, some years back to CDS, where I, you know, uh, started my project as an MPhil student. I was an MPhil student at JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University. So, uh, it was in this uh, CDS library, one of the greatest libraries you people built, that I could locate some of the interesting works that include 
a biography, quasi autobiographical work of uh, the, you know, the chief engineer of the Cochin Hub project, Robert Bristow, and uh, the Cochin Hub papers and other documents. I remember spending the whole day going through these documents. And after dinner, you know, outside that beautiful CDS canteen or CDS mess, I had a chance to uh, meet Professor Michael Theragan. And in fact, uh, Professor Theragan introduced me to this topic and opened up uh, and told me about the possibilities to explore you know, a uh, history of Cochin. He told me about uh, the port workers of Cochin and their lives. So that generated interest in me. And that, uh, you know, evening, that discussion with uh, you, uh, sir, you know, that, you know, that was a beginning of a long journey. And I'm happy that uh, you are as a, there as a part of audience. And uh, thanks for joining. And uh, thanks, everyone. So, uh, uh yes uh, you know this i know the title can be slightly you know contradictory paradox you know urbanization of backwaters can a water hey. be urbanized so that's the audio uh, Rachel, I'm, uh, am i audible yeah audible uh, audience i request everyone to kindly mute their mic you may speak on just Please. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So in these last six months, uh, you know, uh, especially this monsoon time, the world entered a, an unprecedented phase of, you know, health crisis, a major crisis. And the state missionaries all over the world gained extraordinary control over citizens, their life, their mobility, their right to protest. But despite all these uh, issues, People at Sellanam, near Cochin, the historic port city of Cochin, started or continued a powerful, but unfortunately unnoticed you know, protest because of the sea erosion, especially during the monsoon, makes uh, their precarious life extremely difficult, you know, uh, devastating experience. The activists and leaders of this uh, struggle, Chalanam, you know, movement, repeatedly narrated the link between a massive and continual dredging of the Cochin backwaters and the ecological crisis called sea erosion. It's connected, you know, the massive project and, uh, you know, for, you know, this environmental crisis that is going on around is connected. So. And uh, we have seen this, you know, all of us are familiar with this image, you know, uh, this is called, you know, Kadal Samadhi, a form of protest. That means, you know, they are trying to take their life by drowning themselves in the sea. So this is an outcome of this massive, you know, direct outcome of the massive, massive urbanization of uh, backwaters, urban appropriation of backwater as infrastructure. So the massive harbor building project carried out by the government of India in the Indo World War period, that is between 1920 and 1939, tremendously transformed the patterns of coastal erosion and wave action of an extended region in a run around Cochin. The Masi project consequently affected the densely populated agricultural, fishing, and you know, other villages, you know, villages along the coast and backwaters. The problem is continuing even today, as we can see, as we know, and uh, you know this is a scene where you know the global capitalists, uh, you know, attempt to appropriate every inch of land, fuses with, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call global global climate crisis uh, simultaneously. So this problem of sea erosion in Chellanam is directly linked to this massive project and massive dredging activity that is going on even today you know infrastructure harbor infrastructure is not a, not an artifact not a thing but it's a process it's an ongoing process so and, and this massive and periodic dredging 
to remove sand from the bottom of the port added to the sea erosion. However, as we know, the local struggle against a massive infrastructure project remain unheard, you know, hardly addressed. For instance, in a, the context of uh, Udyoga Mandel, Jay Deviga argued, you know, the, you know, state denial of uh, or uh, and social denial of uh, environmental crisis, industrial, you know, uh, industry-led uh, environmental crisis. And here in Telanam, the issue of sea erosion is often joined by dengue, dengue fever, and all other health hazards, resulting from uneven distribution of fresh water and uneven concentration of urban waste. Here, urbanization is a sort of class phenomenon. It represents an uneven concentration of surplus extracted from elsewhere and from somebody. You know, usually in the context of Cochin, the colonial Cochin, 19th and uh, 20th century Cochin, that's my period of study, agricultural surplus, and the uneven distribution uh, of the effects of industrial urbanization. You know, when we go to Cochin, on the one side, we have such a beautiful harbor, fine harbor, fine buildings, and, uh, you know, ships are coming from all over the world, but the other side, we have villages like Chalanam, we have villages like Vaipin, and uh, many other issues which I would be talking, you know, gradually. So the, uh, and uh, as we know, the, uh, the example of Chalanam is one among many in Cochin to understand how the process of urbanization has been a dense socio-spatial process that goes beyond the spatially bounded settlement type of the city. However, much of the studies on the question of urbanization is silent about the physical, ecological foundation of the process, its physical, ecological foundation of the city. At the same time, as uh, this uh, image shows, the photograph shows, uh, the port city of Cochin is depicted as a queen, queen of Arabian Sea, a great center of culture, heritage, tourism, a cradle of consumption. Then here the question here is then what kind of city we want. Here I'm talking about the, the right to the city. Henry Lefebvre talked about the right to the city in the 1960s and 1970s. So in the Lefebian sense, you know, transformed and renewed right to urban life. It's a powerful concept that has been central to several radical urban social movement that aim to remake the urban space we live in, more inclusive and more habitable, the right to the city or, uh, or the right of the urban poor, migrants and dispossessed to access the city as the use value of nature, not exchange value of uh, real estate or buildings and uh, you know, prioritize use value, the use value of nature. Here, it required, I argue that it required an integrated theory of city and urban life. We need a new vocabulary of urban that include not just the administrative territory that is demarcated as the city. If you go to uh, an earlier map, this is an 18, you know, 69 map of uh, question and it's, uh, you know, uh, backwater and uh, other hinterland region. If you carefully see this map, where do we, you know, demarcate this is city and this is village, this is urban, this is non-urban. So that's a question a historical geographer need to ask, need to, need to develop a new vocabulary. So here I'm employing the critical urban theory perspective developed by radical geographers that include uh, David Harvey, Henry Lefebvre, Neil Smith and Neil Brunner. And I, argue for a collective right, collective right rather than an individual right to access the resource that city that embodies. We talk about a collective power over the process of urbanization. So here, the right to the city means 
some kind of shaping power over the process of urbanization, over the ways in which our cities are made and in a way radically remade. And who has a power to remake that city? Who has that power to remake that urban? So, so what is the historian's uh, role here to understand the contemporary process, contemporary neoliberal urbanization? As a student of history, do we have a clear idea of the nature of our task in exploring the most neglected field of our uh, human right? That is right to prioritize the use value of nature of the city. Right to plan the city, right to control the urban process. To plan a city for people, not for profit. So it was in this 1970s radical urban theorist, Henry Lefebvre, David Harvey, and Manuel Castell revisited the concept of urban and the city in its foundational level. Castell in 1970s asked this question, are there a specific urban unit? What is a city? And now, you know, when we come to 2020, when you know, after this uh, lockdown, thousands of people had to exode us from the cities. When they realize that they, they don't belong to that city they live in for 20 years or 30 years. They, you know, this is a time we, we live in such a critical moment that required reformulation of the category of urban. We need to redefine a category of urban it's a, in its a foundational, uh, foundational level. So to do this, I structure my discussion into four uh, different parts. So first we will uh, revisit uh, the studies on Cochin and other port cities uh, called colonial port city studies. This is a major, you know, well-developed uh, area in uh, urban studies uh, in South Asia and the Indian Ocean world. And we'll try to understand the way the colonial port city was imagined and uh, you know, uh, developed as a category, as, a, as an island, as an enclave. Then we will move on to a critical urban theory to, to decipher, to understand urban as a variegated pattern. And, uh, you know, we also try to understand the pathways, you know, multiple pathways of urbanization. So then in the context of uh, Cochin, we will elaborate, you know, that uh, dialectical process of urbanization or, uh, you know, extended and uh, concentrated urbanization, you know, the, you know, unbuilding and upbuilding of the city, massive urbanization of backwaters, coast, and, uh, you know, what we call a mud bank. So, um, uh, so, you know, port city studies, colonial port city is a quite well-developed, uh, area of research, as all of us uh, might have noticed. So the existing studies on the colonial port cities that include the port city of Cochin limited a sphere of inquiries to a spatially bounded settlement unit called the port city or the city. They can, you know, we imagine city as a container of urban. A settlement typology centric uh, mode of analysis emphasized on the demarcation of urban and non-urban city hinterland divide. Urban historians, you know, maritime urban historians spend much of their energy to demarcate, uh, you know, this uh, city hinterland divide. The history of the 19th and 20th century South Asian port cities is often told as a history of the distinct urban experience shaped by external contact, the colonial enclave or colonial city. Cochin is imagined as a colonial city in most of this uh, administrative and popular narrative. And this uh, dominant functionalist model is an accepted norm in the port city studies the past eight decades. You know, we consider urbanization as a process of city expansion, a horizontal expansion of city. You know, if we revisit urban studies, the colonial port city studies in the 19th 60s, uh, majority of the studies were 
influenced by the modernization paradigm you know for and uh, you know in, in the indian context or indian ocean context we have rodos morphis uh, geographical analysis of the port city or peter rimmer study on new zealand susan levandowski and susan neil studies on madras and many more so they imagine colonial port cities as western import manifestation of uh, western influence western dominance and uh, western kind of you know transplant in other ways you know uh, traditional landscape and when we move forward to 1960s uh, 70s and 1980s a system model you know this uh, considering city as a system gain dominance in the indian ocean context uh, we have uh, scholars like frank bros in the benga sadish chandra and uh, many more they developed this categories called gateway city and uh, uh, gateway city gateway of uh, western culture or the gateway of western cultural interaction a point of interaction a nodal point of interaction between traditional and uh, modern west and uh, east so there also they imagine port city city as an island city as an enclave so and uh, they emphasized you know their central emphasis emphasize was to understand cultural and morphological similarities of the port cities that resulted from commonality of or commonalities in the experience of western colonialism they developed a model to study bombay calcutta and madras and other major colombo and uh, karachi and other port cities and uh, try to fit in all other cities within that do, within those dominant model especially bombay's model uh, they developed a typology of port city, port city they adopted a system model to understand you know and they attempted to portray indian ocean ports as a system as a network formed out of uh, geographical and political common factors and uh, long histories of cultural interaction or uh, colonialism was a, at the center of uh, discussion so this kind of you know structuralist geographical model of conceiving a horizontal cart cartography of uh, colonial expansion conceive the port city as a nodal point of economic and cultural you know economic and cultural transformation nodal point of uh, kind of you know modernization so therefore port histories based on world system theory palestinian uh, world system theory emphasized on the form functional specificity and network of interactions of a city within a hierarchic world system of cities there in that model hinterland remain you know continued as homogeneous empty landscape so the world system theory model that stressed on the spatial differences of the city and the hinterland left little room to explore how the process of urbanization involved issues of competition issues of marginalization production of peripheries at various special various special scales that include you know regional national and at times global you know scales so the colonial port history model perceived the hinterland as a uniformly even space and located the colonial port cities as dynamic spaces and a gateways of modern formation but when we come to 1990s and 2000s the theories of uh, globalization you know be, uh, started becoming a, a fad in academia global academia so the port cities have been increasingly depicted by the globalization model globalization you know uh, theorists as the agent or the nodal space of globalization then they try to uh, you know understand try to elaborate a long or uh, try to trace a long history of globalization and uh, consider port city as a the best example to understand that long history of uh, globalization and you know urbanization as a universal diffusion of cities this is a model they develop you know as peter rail you know peter taylor identified around uh, 100 names like uh, you know ajo city to uh, you know uh, hub and uh, special economic zones to you know we have a global city number of uh, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, um, names and lexicons to, you know, to identify the new cities, the explosion of uh, city spaces. So, uh, so this is the model. And but at the same time, this model largely ignored the peripheries, margins, and fissures produced by the process of, uh, you know, globalization. That city model, which uh, the, the the model they developed so largely. So, and uh, broadly, the field of maritime urban history in South Asia rests on the following assumptions. Number one, the colonial port city studies imagine port city city as a pre-existing universal settlement type, and the task of a historian was to elaborate. It's working in different geographical context. That in maybe Cochin, that can be Vishakhapatnam, that can be, you know, Koilon, that can be any other, you know, Calicut or any other city. But the same model exists. Number and second assumption: colonialism is a foundational concept to study the history of modern ports and harbors. Third, port city is a distinct type of settlement. Indicated by specific economic and demographic parameters, required, requiring to be studied as a geographically separate space from its suburbs, its villages, as an island. You know, port cities are always imagined as an island. As a consequence of these assumptions, maritime urban history of colonial South Asia has narrowed its geographical limits of inquiry. To the major port cities, with steam shipping, railway, and other transport network. Suppose if you study Cochin's history, these are the catalog provided by urban, you know, port city historians that uh, you know you need to identify the, the existence of a major harbor, railway network, and major commodities. This resulted, you know, this kind of cataloging resulted in disregarding. The dynamics of peripheral regions and local traders, micro commodities, and the non-mechanized communication and industrial infrastructure. The port city studies. There are studies, but obviously there are exceptions. But uh, you know, in the port city literature, you know, uh, so um, you know, for instance, uh, if you take Southwest Indian coast, or if you go to Gujarat coast, or if you consider Orissa coast. These are referred as hinterland or subordinate port systems of uh, Bombay or some other port city. Now, I argue that this coherent city hinterland divide is problematic. In the context of Cochin, I argue that the forms and pathways of urban agglomeration of Cochin was integrally connected to the spatial politics of the princely states of Travancore and Cochin. That were indirectly ruled by the British paramount power, and uh, this include, uh, you know, the, the you know, the, sp the special politics of this princely state include the intensification of land use for agro business enterprises, the building of uh, large scale infrastructures of roads, canals, ports, and industrialization of hinterland. To support massive extraction of nutrients as commodities for our urban consumption, without uh, kind of you know understanding this uh, intertwined, integrated process of uh, you know that urbanization of hinterland, industrialization of hinterland, or operationalization of hinterland, the Cochin's history cannot be you know kind of uh, urban history cannot be understood uh, in its complexity. So the you know and uh, this process, I argue. In this presentation, that can be illustrated by exploring large-scale operationalization of Wembenard Lake as industrial and transport infrastructure in the late 19th or the second part of the 19th and the 20th century. I argue that there is no singular universal morphology. There is no singular, you know, universal urban prototype. To understand the colonial port city. Therefore, here I do not consider morphology or population as a criteria to identify 
a specific specially bounded and visible urban unit. Instead, I try to understand urban as a dialectical process. The one side, uh, the extended urbanization of hinterland, and the other side, a concentrated urbanization of uh, you know, uh, Cochin as, a, as an urban agg agglomeration. So here, in this context, first we need to define what is urban. If you need a new category to new vocabulary to define vocabularies to define urban, you know we need to do. I mean, uh, you know, to 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 do that. So in this co in the context of this study, uh, the concept urban, the you know, in the present study refers to a process, not a territorial unit, not a typology of urban settlement, the city. So therefore, my presentation will not refer, discuss uh, the, the, the spatial structure or population pattern or culture of uh, the port city of Cochin or Matanjeri or uh, Fort Cochin. Of course, uh, the city or the dense space of infrastructure and its economic activities are important, very important, as the constitutive, constitutive essence of the urbanization. However, Urbanization was equally a dynamic process of transforming socio-spatial relations across a vast space of non-city landscape. Here, however, urbanization does not refer, does not suggest a horizontal expansion of the city. Urbanization does not refer to city growth. The process of urbanization in the context of Cochin, refers to not horizontal, but the vertical differentiation as well. Or the thousand layers of uneven development that uh, happen simultaneously. So the urban process involved a transformation of socio-ecological specificities to facilitate a conversion of use value of nature into commodities. The physical landforms of coast water bodies, plains, and hills were appropriated as ports, markets, canals, and roads. And here we need to notice these were not merely the networks that connected a city and its hinterland, but the socio-spatial organization of landforms as urbanized extractive landscape or the commodification of landscape, commodification of uh, landscape or conversion, appropriation of landscape as means of production. Towards this, rather than focusing on morphology or demography, as I've mentioned, or culture of the colonial port city, we need to focus on how the changing spatial organization of capitalism produced uneven landscape of urbanization extended landscape of urbanization. So the attempt here is not to deny the existence of city as a powerful reality, but to revise the binary model of a city and the hinterland as geographical contrast that is dominant in the port city imaginary of uh, South Asia or largely Indian Ocean. And this study is premised upon David Harvey's theorization of urban process as a creation of a material physical infrastructure for production, circulation, exchange and consumption. The process of urbanization, the context does not merely refer to a horizontal expansion of the material infrastructures of road, canal, railway, and ports and market. So the urbanization of capital, here we understand as the relentless process of the operationalization of non-urban land form as means of production, as industrial infrastructure, as transport infrastructure, or as uh, uh, commodities, landscape itself as commodities. So in other words, you know, uh, this was a dialectical process of uh, spatial integration by developing roads and communication infrastructures, capital attempt to reach out to you know, all possible corners of a planet, the attempt of capital to integrate uh, so, you know, space globally, but at the same time, the same process produces 
differentiation. Spatial integration required massive investment of capital in fixed, you know, fixed capital, the development of uh, roads, railway, ports, and communication infrastructure. That will lead to a production of unevenness in you know, uneven terrain, uneven landscape differentiation. And this the same process would lead to fragmentation of the existing economies, of the existing social relationship. So therefore, you know, uh, drawing on Andre Lefebvre's uh, uh, dialectical triad of the production of space, I argue that uh, you know this you know uh, urbanization was a dialectical process that include simultaneous process of spatial integration, spatial differentiation, and fragmentation. So in other words, the history of urban ag agglomeration of the colonial port cities were intertwined with a large scale operationalization of the non-city space. The concept of operationalization in the context of the study refers to the appropriation of the use value of nature, use value of socio-ecological specificities as productive forces to realize the exchange value, urbanization of you know nutrient, urban appropriation of nutrients. So here, the radical urban geographer read you know defined the urban as a scale, scale of uh, daily geographical sphere of abstract labor. Here, Neil Smith uh, gave centrality to Marx's uh, concept of the dialectics of use value and exchange value to explain the spatiality of capitalism, you know, uh, to, you know, uh, uh, to, as uh, the crucial theoretical foundation to understand, to define capitalism. So therefore, you know, here we understand city not as a geographical description, but we understand the city as a theoretical perspective, theoretical, cat, you know, question. Urban is a theoretical question in this uh, context. And, uh, and uh, Lefebvre uh, in the 1960s argued that the, the clear distinction that once existed between the urban and the rural was gradually fading into a set of porous spaces of uneven geographical development under the hegemony of, and under the hegemonic command of capital and the state. That include, uh, you know, in, a, you know, in the contemporary context, uh, if you see that, you know, uh, for instance, uh, um, what do you call the level of violence, you know, violence against uh, agricultural producers or urban property development and its expansion or uh, the wave state systems redefining private property rights globally, as uh, Croy Ross would call it, uh, global, grand, uh, global land grab or uh, Kathleen McAfee used the term green grab. Or uh, Neil Brunner would use the term planetary urbanization to depict this process of, uh, you know, this uh, urban, the complete, uh, what Lefebvre in the 1960s called the complete urbanization of society. Here, the complete urbanization of society does not refer to horizontal expansion of uh, urban across the planet, but uh, rather the production, the urban domination and the, the, how the urban domination reproduces fissures, reproduces islands of peripheries and marginality. You know, so the, um, so therefore, you know, uh, in, you know, this is uh, coming from this theoretical perspective is basically coming from Lefebvre's idea of uh, Lefebvre's conceptualization of the production of space. As we know, space that include the city is generally treated as a container or a pre-existing reality. But Lefebvre, the 1960s, 1970s, uh, in his study, Production of Space, argued that space is produced. Space is socially produced. Space is a social product. For instance, you know, every society produced their own, you know, uh, you know uh, relation with nature like this. You know, we have on the one side, we have, uh, you know, a Neolithic space, Neolithic village space. Other side, we have an industrial city. So this, uh, in a sense, is defining our relation, social relation with nature, but uh, this also defines relationship between people and people, so, you know, social groups and social groups. So here, 
you know, to understand this process, to understand this modern capitalistic process of redefining the nature, Lefebvre used the term urban society, especially this uh, industrial society, you know, that how, you know, the expression of uh, urban society, you know, meets our theoretical need. That's what we need to elaborate in our own specific context. So the, you know, and uh, um, so, um, so this Lefebvre's project in the 1960s and 1970s was to reconfigure the existing urban research. Until then, throughout the social science, especially in sociology, urban analysis was largely descriptive. Even now, urban analysis is largely descriptive. So the only exception was uh, maybe the Chicago School, you know, which remained influential into the 1960s. So especially, I'm referring to the writings of uh, uh, the Chicago School of Urban Sociologist, uh, Louise Wirth. You know, Wirth uh, defined urbanism as a way of life. He identified large population size, high population density, and high level of uh, demographic heterogeneity as a defining feature of urbanism. Urban research, because you know, uh, uh, to, you know, discuss this uh, to point out that urban research even now relay more on empirical generalization than on theory. You know, theory presence. You know, we go for uh, morphology. We go for infrastructural density. We go for more than anything. We go for population pattern to define, you know, to to you know to identify settlement typologies as uh, the city, suburb, and villages. So Lefebvre in the 1970s proposed the idea called the complete urbanization of society to revise the idea that cities represent a particular type of territory. That could be defined in opposition to other, in opposition to village. But uh, the you know this created a lot of confusion among urban researchers. This amounted to a horizontal cartography of urban question, urban, suburb, and rural. The Fabian concept of uh, urban society are often used to refer to any city or any urban agglomeration. As a result of this confusion, we have forgotten or overlooked the social relationship with which uh, each urban type is associated. City, city has a visible enclave. So that, uh, that's a confusion, you know, uh, uh, happened out of this. I'm, you know, uh, so, but at the same time, remember this urban society does not argue that everything is city. Rather, it refers to variegated landscape of urbanization, margins and peripheries. And, uh, you know, and the central argument is that uh, the city cannot be understood as a particular kind of place, but the city as a social relationship building process. So the, so here, then we need a new perspective to study this urban. If we unsettle the existing idea that city is a place, if you reject that, we need to have another, like, you know, another theoretical perspective, another category to understand this. So it was, based, you know, largely Lefebvre and later Neil Smith and Neil Brunner, these radical geographers developed, uh, you know, they argued that a city is a scale, not a place, but a scale, a scale that exists with other scales of organizing socio-spatial life that include uh, the regional scale. The regional scale is a scale of organizing social life, cultural life, economic life, the national scale, and the worldwide or global scale. Specifically, urban is imagined not as a container or a, of the city, but as a socio-spatial relation embedded within a dynamically evolving you know, totality whole. So, uh, so therefore, we consider scale as a crucial concept in geography to study, uh, you know, uh, what we call, you know, the urban process. So, uh, so, um, so Lefebvre, for instance, in the 1970s, developed uh, the concept urban fabric as a foundational concept 
to illustrate the variegated and the polymorphic geographies of urbanization. So the Fabian concept would allow us to take this process, you know, open up this process of urbanization to understand, uh, to use the category, to use the concept, to develop the concept called urbanization of backwaters, urbanization of hillscape, urbanization of underwater, you know, urbanization in this context, in the context of the present study, is not a terrestrial activity alone. Urbanization is an active, you know, it's a process of appropriating, you know, that hydraulic specificities, hydraulic socio, socio ecological specificities. So we go for, you know, extreme territories of urbanization to understand, you know, uh, you know. Uh, so we have uh, recent studies on uh, urbanization of Himalayas means urban domination. So here, you know, uh, when we come to Kerala, this concept is not a new uh, theoretical perspective or anything, you know, we, uh, you know, there are attempts to, there have been attempts to understand urban as a theoretical category, in the context of Kerala as well. Or specifically in, the, in the Kerala's context, urban had always been a concern for historians you know, for urban historians or economic historians of Kerala. This would even go back to the colonial documents, you know, Wada and Corners uh, Geographical Survey provide uh, a beautiful geographical description of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, towns and inland markets and all. And, uh, and uh, if you read the official histories of uh, Travin Gura and Cochin princely states or, uh, you know, uh, William Logan's Malabar Manual, they also spend a lot of time to understand, you know, this... Uh, you know, this uh, category called urban. Then when we come to, uh, you know, there are so many studies, I can't uh, mention all those uh, studies here because of limited time. But uh, when we come to mid 19, sorry, mid 20th century, with a great scholar, rather unnoticed scholar, PJ Thomas has, uh, so, you know, uh, published uh, different articles, you know, you know uh, numerous articles on this aspect of urbanization the context of question, you know, in the context of Kerala, in this uh, Madras Geographical Association journal, you know, uh, and later we have, you know, Han Sheng's uh, views on Aleppi, attempt to study the pattern of third world urbanization. It's an important, uh, you know, study that would try to that try to take out, you know, to, you know, take away this, uh, you know, uh, urban question beyond uh, settlement typology, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, and uh, um, so then uh, yeah, we also have uh, T.T. Srigumar's uh, study on the urban processes of Kerala. So this can be an exceptional and important study. You know, T.T. Srigumar used the term, the concept called uh, urban or urban, rural plus urban, to refer to the high spatial dispersion of the town, dispersion of, you know, the town in southwest India. But, you know, uh, Srigumar's study illustrated a mixed model that tend to dilute the aspect of the overwhelming urban domination of the social and economic activities of an extended landscape. So instead of going for that uh, balanced, uh, you know, uh, perspective, uh, you know, we need to see the, the impacts of urban domination. So that's the, you know, um, otherwise, you know, this is an extremely important concept, uh, you know, need to be further elaborated, uh, T.T. Srikumar's, uh, you know, you know, concept. So, uh, so, and uh, we also have, uh, you know, recent interventions globally made by urban political ecologists to redefine a category called urban. For instance, uh, uh, you know, William Cronin's study on Chicago and Great West. You know, this seminal work elaborated the role of hinterland as a constituent element in the production of Chicago in the 19th century as a metropolis. We also have Fernand Brodel's study on a Mediterranean region, and he argued that, uh, uh, you know, he demonstrated the centrality of Alps Mountain, Alps Mountains uh, and its passages as a crucial geographical factor, the production of uh, 
urban landscape of uh, German listeners. We also have uh, studies by Louis Mumford, uh, uh, mid 20th century studies. Uh, you know, uh, Mumford argued that uh, we have to write uh, natural history of urbanization, not uh, city history of urbanization. So, but uh, most of these studies are, uh, you know, providing a metropolitan background, metropolitan context of urbanization, extended landscape of urbanization. What we require in the context of uh, Cochin or Southwest India is a different, uh, you know, a perspective, a, a colonial context to understand that variegated patterns and pathways of urbanization in the context of Cochin. And uh, uh, <clears throat> recent, you know, last uh, 10 years, we have studies by, you know, urban political ecologists. They explore urban political ecology as an area of research in political ecology, UPE, explore how urbanization is very much a process of socio-metabolic transformation. They attempt to understand the urban in terms of environmental politics. UPE, urban political ecology, reformulate the political economy to take environmental politics seriously. The city as a socio-ecological process. Attempt to revise the issue of city-nature dualism. So they argue that environmental transformation are not independent of class, gender, ethnicity, or other power struggle. Urban political ecology research has begun to show that because of underlying economic, political, and cultural processes inherent in the production of urban landscape, urban change tend to be spatially differentiated and highly uneven. We have scholars including Eric Sinjandov, Maria Keika, and uh, Roger Kale and Nick Heinen and many others. So, uh, and uh, you know there is a powerful uh, you know argument made by David Harvey in the 1993 that there is nothing unnatural about the New York City. So there I you know present uh, you know in this context uh, the context of Cochin to revisit these theories in the context of uh, Cochin and uh, Wembenard Lake. I make uh, three uh, major observation. You know, three major arguments in the context of Cochin and Wembenard, we can argue that urban is a polymorphic. You know, we can identify different paths, patterns, and pathways of urbanization. And to study history of Cochin and to study history of uh, Wembenard Lake, we need to revise the divide between city and uh, the hinterland. And uh, moreover, to understand this landscape, we need to locate urbanization as a dialectical process of concentrate, you know, concentrated and uh, extended urbanization. So now, you know, uh, to uh, you know, the next uh, part, I will uh, try to, you know, uh, illustrate this process with the help of uh, some examples. Three examples. Uh, you know, uh, first is the example of uh, the Wembenard backwaters. You know, and uh, then, uh, if time allows, we'll move forward. You know, uh, these theoretical perspective, perspectives make it, you know, important to revise the history of urbanization as a, you know, uh, kind of, you know, as a dialectical process on the one side, extended processes or processes of socio-spatial and socio-environmental transformation of the backwaters and the agglomeration of population, capital investment and infrastructure development you know, all these aspects. So, you know, for instance, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, mid, mid 20th century Cochin, Cochin. You know, we celebrate this image as a sign of prosperity, as a sign of, uh, you know, uh, our external trade, and we always connect uh, Cochin. Whenever we study Cochin, centrality is given to trade, long distance trade. But our attempt to move backward to the backwater region, how the operationalization of this backwater region was central, how this uh, you know, transformation of socio-spatial relationship of the backwater region was central in the making of uh, the, the cradle of uh, consumption or uh, the rich urban space is largely missing in our uh, urban 
you know urban studies you know for instance you know this uh, many of our official histories uh, and gazetteers celebrate kerala as a garden of coconut you know we imagine you know coconut cultivation in kerala is a historyless process but i would argue that was not historyless process it was very much uh, a 19th century development a commercialization of landscape was a 19th century you know uh, i know a process it is essential to notice that the colonization of southwest indian wetland region with coconut palm you know palms was a you know uh, you know uh, kind of modern process and that was a process with a lot of frictions conflicts and marginalization and uh, you know dispossession or a massive massive privatization of uh, common property if you can use the term common property resources or the backwaters and hydraulic resources and this was a process dominated by merchant capital uh, so um, you know this uh, this is again volcart uh, you know um, uh, yard in uh, you know kochen you know this uh, uh, cask you know this uh, um, um, oil cask are getting ready to be exported to london and marseille and uh, uh, other you know hamburg and other cities so we need to move backward and see that the production of coir production of coconut oil was based on large scale cultivation of coconut that's a one side and large scale appropriation of backwater as industrial infrastructure for instance you know you know retting of coir fiber required you know um, large scale appropriation of backwater it required you know 6 to 8 months of retting process you know the massive retting of coconut fiber pollute the common property resources of the backwater we know that you know there are different modes of organizing life uh, depend on you know backwater different types of uh, people and uh, you know a mode of living depends on backwater so that uh, you know the but uh, the retting 6 to or 8 months long retting emit you know this pollute you know pollutant chemical the pollutant chemical produced by the retting of the coconut fiber began to affect the wetland fishing and rice production 19th and 20th century so that means you know the industrial need of the backwater as watershed contradicted with the infrastructural demand of the rice cultivators and fishermen you know in cochin and its impact was uh, you know uh, drastic on the one side if you see this is the export uh, chart of cochin it's uh, kind of you know going up every year in the late 19th century so the this is a much uh, outcome of the much celebrated co you know, land of coconut but uh, i argue this was socially produced you know this uh, process and uh, see the other side of uh, coconut uh, you know that's industrialization of uh, agricultural field industrialization of backwater in 19 in 1865 ravangur was an a rice exporting region i'm not saying that overseas export but uh, it uh, you know it had rice surplus i'm not also saying that uh, everybody had rice to eat the condition existed in ravangur even in the 19th century was a contradictory condition you know the coexistence of uh, opulence and poverty you know if you can use that you know karl polanyi's uh, term you know co poverty and uh, opulence coexist or uh, overflowing bins and uh, md stomach was the kind. but uh, this was a rice producing region and uh, gradually when we come to you know 1923 40% of rice we required you know in travancore region we are to import massive dependence on the shipping industry massive dependence on you know the urban mercantile class to have your daily food so this is outcome you know of uh, that the industrialization agro the making of uh, the backwater region as an agro industrial belt so the uh, and uh, this also resulted the concentration of coir capital and this concentration of coir capital in cochin was realized through massive 
and extended project of converting backwaters into long distance waterways for bulk commodity transportation. The rolling and mercantile elites of uh, colonial as well as the princely state started identifying the coast and backwaters as a spaces to be modified as waterways, roads, and ports to integrate the resource rich hinterland to the internal uh, to the international market. You know, the water, you know, the the, the basic purpose of uh, backwaters was redefined as a water channel from the late 19th century. So a colonial port town therefore can be located as part of the such spatial organization to accelerate the circulation of use value of nature in the capitalist market. You know, so this is the, the figure, you know, that uh, export of coir and coconut oil from, you know, uh, um, uh, the Travangur, especially North Travangur region. Now we need to go beyond uh, that uh, trade figure to understand this, uh, these graphs as a, a massive industrialized process of appropriating nature as nutrients as commodities that involved uh, destruction of uh, many other you know, existing economic activities and relationship. And this was realized also you know, by you know, uh, developing reconfiguring landscape as uh, transport infrastructure, appropriation of uh, landform, geo, you know, socio-ecological specificities as uh, transport infrastructure. For instance, the public work department of the government of Travangur and Cochin started to spend about 40% of the annual state revenue, state income, to develop canals, to facilitate uninterrupted circulation of bulk commodities that include uh, coconut and spices and crows and oil. You know, you know, this is the PWD investment figure of Travangur and Cochin, uh, sorry, Travangur. So the, um, and uh, this is a story obvious to many of us, but uh, you know, it's a so contradictory social outcome of the massive privatization of water body is less discussed. I mean, the appropriation of landform as commercial infrastructure contradicted with uh, spaces of locally specific agroecological activities such as fishing, backwaters, transport, wetland, rice cultivation, you know, uh, and, uh, and the, you know, uh, this was a project realized also with the help of uh, not just the colonial capital, but the, the Travangur princely state and the princely state bureaucracy, you know, uh, for instance, uh, you know, um, the late 19th century, Travangur princely state realized uh, these major, you know, canal networks by appropriating, you know, uh, the, you know, the swampy landscape and converted them into transit canals, jetties and lighthouse embankments and, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, channels. 19, uh, you know, um, for instance, you know, AVM Canal, Alapura, that, you know, Travangur Princely uh, State PWD allotted 39,000 out of their 80,000 budget every year from, you know, for a decade to realize this canal and its functioning. So uh, to provide a barrier-free channel of network. And opposing this, this kind of, you know, massive concentration of uh, labor and capital, labor and state revenue, mainly coming from agricultural revenue, the development of canal, development of, uh, you know, uh, transport infrastructure, Malayala Manorama, 19, you know, uh, the early 20th century called the Travangur PWD, the Department of Public Waste. It was called the DPW, that's why Department of Public Waste. They wrote an edit, you know, English editorial so that these, uh, you know, uh, you know, English bureaucrats would read that, and they argued that the major portion of the resources of the state has been lavished upon the European, you know, European interest. So, uh, and because of these canals, the infrastructural demands of the country boards and steamers for deeper waterways required 
conversion of lagoons and canals and remember these uh, canals had many fishing in, you know fishing infrastructures and the churning of these swampy and shallow backwaters led to conflicts between the fishing and agricultural infrastructure requirement so towards the end of the 19th century the steamboat owned by the alappi and cochin based mercantile companies began to majorly disrupt fishing and country boat navigation in a, uh, you know uh, in vembanad backwaters malayalam manorama and deepika both uh, newspapers uh, every day they had articles complaining that was it is uh, made by these company boats or steam boats or the the european company boats or you know indian owned company boats they argue you know there is a interesting quote you know there are many of them earlier when i remember wrote in 1909 earlier water transport journey were not quite difficult it was much before the new sense called steam boats companies earlier anybody could access boats according to their convenience now at every jetty one can only see these companies other small boats cannot enter the jetty without getting a prior approval of these companies this clearly refers to the privatization of uh, this water scape you know that's uh, uh, and uh, not just that the expansion of steamships conflicted with the interest of the rich syrian christian and nair landlords who invested in the reclamation of backwaters to expand the paddy cultivation so with the help of a steam pump and uh, meagerly paid low cost uh, lower cost uh, agricultural laborers the rice entrepreneurs of kotanad region reclaimed uh, more than you know 5500 acres of backwaters paddy field in the late 19th century later also however the pwd of the government of madras considered the backwater reclamation for paddy cultivation as an obstruction to connect inland town with cochin the massive churning of backwater was also considered as a threat to the port of cochin since the reclamation was led to the silting up of a sandbar at the mouth of the cochin harbor so therefore preserving the stability of the backwater was important for uh, uh, the, the colonial authorities preserving the backwaters was important to support the urbanized industrial activity and it's a uh, you know water transport requirement this was a priority this became priority so due to this pressure from the government of madras the travancore government banned backwater reclamation for paddy cultivation in 1903 so rachel uh, am i uh, running out of time should i conclude with this one example question uh, i uh, can speak on for uh, 5 to 10 minutes more possibly and then we okay. if you could find it all right okay yeah i mean uh, yeah so um um so this uh, urban appropriation of landscape was not limited to this inland waterscape if you go to you know the question question coast the expansion of steam shipping network in the later decade of the 19th century this was a crucial technological development as we know developed uh, to to you know basically to aid overseas export activity steam shipping especially after the opening of the suez canal in 1869 so but uh, this steam shipping activities on the one side liberated you know this uh, circulation activity from its uh, you know many limitations for instance uh, sail ships always encountered monsoon as a limiting factor and steam ship also accelerated the turnover time of capital you know so you know within a short period of time they could reach so uh, the other other side of the sea so therefore you know you know the port of cochin if you see port of cochin from 1857 to you know 1913 14 you know that the the tonnage handled by steam shipping steam ships remarkably increased you know number of vessels these are steam vessels 
but the streaming stream uh, you know stream shipping activity had to depend on large scale conversion of uh, coastal ecological specificities as transport infrastructure for instance you know cochin chamber of commerce the body of the british merchants considered you know after the opening of the, the suez canal after the arrival you know the you know the kind of you know the in, you know the um, in increase in the shipping steep shipping activities cochin chamber of commerce or the british merchants found the sandbar at the mouth of the cochin harbor as a barrier cochin backwaters as a barrier to overcome they started you know perceiving the backwater necessarily as a shipping channel so they tried to appropriate the appropriation of land and water as infrastructure for the shipping activities were not limited to administrative boundary of the municipal town of cochin or municipal town of matanjeri or ernakulam the development of shipping infrastructure was a geographically expanded process of modifying the existing mode of organizing landform and water bodies as source of livelihood for instance the appropriation of the mud bank in chagra as a monsoon anchorage for steam shipping as a process that involved conflicts with uh, local fishing economies as we know you know chagra is a sign of prosperity for us but uh, at the same time steam ships after 1860s started you know claiming this space because the port authority found the mud bank as a suitable anchorage for the steam ship and large country craft because the calm water tract created by created at the sea by the thick deposit of alluvial soil washed down from uh, the sahyadri hills during the monsoon was called mud bank the mud bank extending up to 3 to 4 kilometers into the sea functioned as a wave dumper and thus provided a smooth monsoon anchorage for harbor monsoon harbor for both large ocean going ships and you know country craft and this muddy allu alluvial deposit carried out by carried out to sea created zones of calm water where multiple economic activities were possible you know this porakkad alappuzha and nyarakkel these were the signs you know this uh, sites of uh, signs of prosperity but uh, you know throughout this late 19th century there are records of conflicts between shipping interest the mercantile interest and fishing interest you know if you see that uh, image you know this mud bank you know travancore coast and backwaters you know this in this photograph you know there are that's a you know uh, you could see a mud bank alappi road the mud bank you know mud bank formation where uh, ships are anchored this is a site meant to be i mean uh, also you know uh, meant to be you know kind of you know for sh uh, shipping uh, sorry fishing activity so so this uh, kind of you know in cochin the colonial authority after you know 1870s and 1880s the colonial authorities identified the backwater as a natural harbor meant to be redeveloped for steam ships but you know dredging a ship channel to cutting across the sandbar and to make you know this uh, shallow backwater into a shipping channel was not an easy process for this uh, you know this uh, colonial engineers for a really long time but uh, it was after this uh, you know the world war 1 they identified cochin backwaters as a site to be appropriated as shipping you know channel you know this is an interesting image you know i would try to conclude here you know matanjeri sorry this matanjeri fort cochin region is depicted as a thick urban space and if we cross you know that wellington island you know venduruthi island and wellington island to you know the mainland uh, you know region from british cochin to turn towards that you know that's a uh, empty and homogeneous space 
to be appropriated for uh, shipping activity, to be appropriated for urban activity. So, um, you know, um, and they developed, you know, this is a site, you know, what, you, what we see in front of us, they were, you know, in 1920s, they were around uh, 2,600 fishing stakes in the backwater of Cochin. To make that uh, economic activity an important activity for the Wala and other fishing communities in Cochin. And if you go to the mouth of that harbor near British Cochin, there were 120 fishing stakes in the mouth of the harbor. And there were 85 another fishing stakes at the mouth of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, the Raman Turita, that small island in uh, the middle of the backwaters. However, the state, both the princely state records and the British records, use the language of public good and safety to justify the increasing state control of the common property resources and to, to remove them. For instance, a survey of fishing industry by the Revenue Department of Cochin State conducted in 1907 complained that the waterways largely used for navigational purpose have often been interrupted by planting these fishing stakes to the dangerous, you know, to the danger to the danger of the public use, you know, using them. You know, that basically they consider the state started considering fishing infrastructure, country boards, and other economic activities as nuisance, as a problem to be eliminated or marginalized. So, and uh, for instance, the Cochin Port Authority argued in, you know, in the 1907 that, you know, I quote them, the ignorant and short sighted fishermen who plan the fishing stake shamelessly create public danger. Obstruct smooth functioning of the, you know, the commercial activity. It was in this context that uh, in 1920s, a Cochin Port Authority, uh, you know, or the, the government of Madras and government of uh, India launched the Cochin Harbor project of converting uh, you know, the large sheet of backwater into a modern harbor, a beautiful harbor. And this involved uh, massive dredging, massive dredging of, uh, you know, the, uh, the backwater. Three to five feet, uh, or three to, three to fourteen feet uh, uh, deep water backwaters were converted into thirty-two feet. You know, uh, uh, you know the ship ship channel. The nine, you know, a period between nineteen twenty and nineteen twenty-nine, and uh, the you know, um, so and this, uh, so not just that. Just to conclude. When they converted the Cochin backwaters into you know, harbor, they also identified not just the backwater, but 6,000 kilometers area as a catchment area of the Cochin port. And the port authority imported regulations. They prevented you know, uh, modifications of this landscape to prevent, you know, to, to, to protect Cochin Harbor or the, you know, the Vembanad backwaters as an industrial infrastructure to facilitate, to facilitate the massive appropriation of uh, nutrients, massive appropriation of natural resources as urbanized commodities. Urbanized commodity required uh, not just this, uh, you know, the, the, you know this, uh, uh, the conversion or the building of a city not just the building of uh, an island, island of a city, but that involved a large-scale reconfiguration of uh, landscape. For instance, the river Periyar was identified as a catchment area of the, the British Cochin Harbour to provide uh, fresh water. At the same time, the same process deprived uh, island dwellers uh, in and around Cochin of uh, fresh water because of uh, the, the number of uh, ships increased Cochin backwaters the water became unusable for the, the you know the, the people live by backwaters and periyar was a uh, river periyar was appropriated as an infrastructure for uh, as an infrastructure to provide electricity to provide fresh water to this harbor so 
you know this uh, in a sense you know i argue that uh, uh, to conclude lack of time i just conclude uh, you know this urbanization the context of uh, the context of colonial capitalism need to go out of uh, the city container to understand large scale you know geographical reconfiguration and uh, you know uneven integration of socio ecological specificities and its uh, urbanization as commodities thank you maybe we can discuss and uh, yeah thank you very much justin professor michael karagan sir would you like to comment first no um I mean, I've, I've, I've got a few comments but i'll, I'll reserve it right now uh, i would request um, rachel to conduct the question and answer session and, uh, and we'll have discussion yes thank you sir uh, the audience are requested to please type in their queries in the chat box and read them out for the speaker who will take them up one by one uh, may may I point out uh, something since there is a gap between the the first question uh, Sure, sir. Can I? Hello. Yes, sir. Please, please. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you know, I was uh, wondering, uh, Dr. Justin, have we also looked at uh, the same um, hinterland backwaters having played uh, not necessarily a similar one, but uh, slightly different type of influence upon another urbanization process that of alipay yes have you also looked at that or yeah in my uh, larger project i have uh, elaborated that uh, but uh, i thought you know uh, my focus today was to focus on that question backwaters you know largely um, um, to elaborate uh, to to demonstrate that intertwined process of uh, the urbanization of cochin and uh, its uh, hinterland waterscape yeah but, but when, I, uh, yeah. yeah yeah you you go ahead you go ahead ha uh, no it's extremely important but why it's uh, another context you know alapis context uh, you know uh, would require um, you know uh, a different uh, Uh, approach i that's what i guess it's uh, where um a centrality will be given to the travancore princely state and uh, their policies yeah, and, i was only uh, yes yeah. i was only asking about it because you know you mentioned at the very outset the effect that the um so, na so called native states uh, and the competitiveness between them might have also played in uh, the uh, realization of what was happening in in in, in cochin yes and there was practically there was a uh, one understanding is that there is practically there was a open uh, rivalry between alp and cochin for a long time yes Yes, that's no, an interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. I was only, I was only inquiring yes. him whether you. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, that's an important aspect to be explored. You know, this that you know, this twin cities uh, and uh, its its production of urban space. Um, before the questions come in, uh, Dr. Justin. I have a query for you, uh, which, if you could think up in the meanwhile, um, though you present through your presentation, you have tried to unsettle the port hinterland binary. The southwest coast of India has been part of the Indian Ocean network for a long period, especially for the early historic periods. The hinterland, quote unquote, is not considered to be very dynamic or agential in the process. While it is not of your immediate concern, in your opinion. 
will it be methodologically valid to extend the modes of thinking that you have employed for earlier periods that do not refer to urban or port in the same sense yeah my answer would be a yes fun no uh, yes because you know we uh, need to explore the networks you know that uh, um, you know we always have a tendency to give centrality to our maritime networks you know connections but at the same time there is a need to you know explore and uh, incorporate other networks and other connections for instance you know uh, across the sahyadris the way we the connect the connections we had with the the other region you know the sahyadri region and uh, beyond that eastern side of uh, uh, is uh, is an equally important concern to understand you know the process of urbanization i will uh, for instance i would refer to ward and corners uh, survey geographical survey so their uh, you know their mode of analysis uh, is slightly different they you know uh, you know they understand uh, uh, you know that uh, southwest coast sahyadris and beyond that the tamil plains as an integral whole that uh, understanding is there so therefore that that's required but uh, at the same time i would argue that uh, you know what i was talking largely about is a, it's a, it's a capitalistic urbanization not uh, an earlier you know uh, city uh, and uh, its hinterland model that need to be you know further elaborated thank you thank you uh, we have uh, yeah. queries in the chat box uh, first is from ayana anthony thank you so much for this very informative session sir before the british constructed the port in kochi where exactly were the ships harbored uh, sir i think you mentioned chellanam as a historical port when was it so mm, no i haven't mentioned chellanam as a historical port um, uh, it was narakal and uh, malipuram where the uh, cochin state uh, controlled uh, anchorages and uh, um, uh obviously uh british cochin was the anchorage of controlled by different colonial authorities from the 15th century uh chellanam was um, rough into chellanam peripheral by that has been going on for last uh, century yeah that's there but uh, before uh, the arrival of uh, before the development of a uh, deep water harbor a uh, cochin harbor ships had to anchor the outer sea and uh, boats you know smaller country boats and other steam boats carried cargo up and down that was a time taking you know uh, inconvenient activity for instance you know one of the major import commodity was uh, rice and uh, you know the kind of pilferage rate was really high you know one of the major reason for you know to, to, to demand uh deep water harbor in cochin was because of the spillage of uh, two important uh, commodities of import they were kerosene oil and uh, rice from burma and other eastern indian ports so that's there so uh, ships would come to before that ships would come to uh, bombay or colombo and uh, smaller ships would carry uh, goods to cochin to outer sea that was a pattern yeah it's a complex process much beyond that i stop here but yeah uh, we have a next query from dr vinita menon excellent thank you so many issues to process i was thinking of alapad black sand mining issue and and vellanathur issue etc how is public good and common property conceptually distinguished in urban theorization um i don't have a clear answer to that i mean in the, maybe in the contemporary context uh, uh, we could uh, use uh, you know distinguish these but uh, see openly telling you you know even common property resource is not the right term to uh, to use uh, uh, you know to refer to backwater region because uh, what existed was different layers of property rights you know uh, you know that uh, uh you know you know uh, fishing communities groups had their right but their right would never prevent uh, other social groups 
you know, a transport worker from accessing that region. Or, a, a, you know, a backwater cultivator from accessing backwater. As a, or a, uh, or a choir, choir uh, artisan from writing his uh, fiber. So that's the, it's not an absolute, I would not use the term common property as an absolute category here. Hmm? So they were, that was relative, but uh, uh, for uh, convenience for this mode of presentation, I use that category, that's the uh, thing. But uh, when, when it comes to then what happened after, you know, 19th century and later, was a massive privatization, massive uh, state control. You know the, the the you know the the what do you call the capitalist domination of uh, these spaces and prioritize uh, their circulatory demand, their industrial demand over all other demands. So if you read uh, Malayala Manorama or the Biga newspaper, in the late 19th, early 20th century, it's full of these reports, full of these conflicts between. Uh, these uh, these interest, but uh, somehow you know our uh, you know historical studies haven't incorporated these you know yeah maybe due to digital uh, access we have uh, access to these newspapers that's why you know yeah. Uh, Dr. Chandrathil Jeevan has a query. We have got a marvelous view of the urbanization of the aquatic systems in a way we hadn't known, at least new for me. Is, it, is there many ecological implications and cons consequences? Uh, is there a few comments you can make? Mm. Okay. Uh, Rachel, I'm afraid I didn't get it uh, fully. Yeah. The, uh, through your talk, we have got a marvelous view of the urbanization of the aquatic systems in a way we hadn't. Yes. It has mm -hmm. many ecological implications and yes. consequences. Is mm. there a few comments you can make? Yeah. Um, See, now, rather than comments, you know, there are uh, uh, many studies, actually, you know, if you uh, see these Cochin universities, uh, science departments, you know, they have uh, excellent studies on how these uh, shipping activities, industrial activities pollute and destroy, you know, uh, backwater ecosystem. Um, you know, uh, there are PhDs, these are available online. Shodh Ganga has all these uh, PhDs available. And I don't, I'm not an expert to give you all those uh, scientific terminologies here, but uh, I found them extremely important and useful to, uh, you know, to, uh, to you know, conceptualize my own work. And uh, recently, Jay Deviga also has worked on this aspect, you know, in the context of Udyoga Mandal, how this environmental destruction, you know, transform, you know, that would, and it's uh, how the state uh, you know, systematically deny this uh, environmental destruction. So that's the that is an important uh, intervention. And uh, also, I forgot to mention the beginning. One of the major influence, one of the major works, uh, in you know, intervention to uh, understand uh, this ecological implication impact. Many layers, not just urban, uh, is Allegal. Allegal that uh, online pamphlet. Uh, uh, you know, published just since I think 2012, at least from 2012, I read, try to read that regularly. That was a major influence to shape my own work. But uh, yeah, sadly, we, we don't have uh, Peter's yet and Peter with us uh, now. But uh, that was a powerful intervention, I, I, would, uh, I would say. That archive is available online, I believe. Or, uh, yeah. So this would lead uh, a reader to Many more, I mean, many more uh, interventions are there. And uh, Katie Ramohan's work, uh, uh, Tales of Rice, uh, History of uh, uh, Rice Field Reclamation, 19th and 20th century, Wembenard. It's a beautiful eco social history of uh, Wembenard backwaters. Yeah. It can go on. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, before moving to the next question, I think, uh, Dr. Jeevan has made a clarification. I meant in that period, not contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, the works I mentioned obviously discuss that period also. I mean, Katie Ramohan's work, uh, for instance, uh, discuss how these uh, 
you know um, you know large scale land reclamation had a socio ecological Im- implication in transforming uh, membranous backwaters and we also have uh, works uh, discussing you know that uh, uh, you know the you know his, that totally spillway and its impact on rice field cultivation a conflict between uh, different interest you know uh, that study is also there i mean um, um yeah i mean so i think my own uh, my own work was largely discussing that you know how these uh, massive uh, dredging activity that happened in cochin the 1920s had a major impact on you know that coastal region you know uh, so uh, the wellington island the island wellington what we see is uh, so it's, it's basically reclaimed out of uh, you know this uh, dredged sediment not just that uh, the land you know land in front of uh, maharaja's college that sendresas region that was also reclaimed uh, you know that period of time but i agree that you know we always have a history of this beautiful harbor and uh, it's a beautiful uh, wharves and uh, ships but not uh, you know uh, recorded documents of uh, these uh, destructions that happened um, you know uh, for over the last 200 years to the backwaters cochin backwaters yeah next query is by radha krishnan mg notwithstanding the uneven development brought about by colonial modernity has not the general economic status of the region improved vis-a-vis the pre-colonial period and if so has the inequality increased yeah um so yeah that's an important uh, interesting question i mean uh, i do not know we do we have to use modernity as an overarching term to understand everything you know uh, that's the uh, that's a you know the the question we need to ask uh, you know uh, the context of uh, cochin or uh, colonial southwest india what is left if we remove that cat that term modernity from our studies you know uh, may not be much i mean so um, you know uh, so that's what i was trying to elaborate here there is a tendency especially in the you know urban history to give centrality to colonialism colonial modernity as the as the the central you know prime mover to understand urban history but uh, when we do that we forget other networks and other connections that you know transformed uh, that shaped our historical experience for instance when we study kochi's history when we study south indian southwest indian history our connection with burma southwest indian burmese connection was a crucial factor in shaping what we understand as modern you know modern kerala our connection with uh, you know uh, sri lanka was extremely important in shaping our uh, you know networks and you know uh, shape, shaping our own modern history but uh, by giving centrality to colonialism we ignore many other networks we ignore many other aspects uh, of uh, understanding our own history by celebrating colonial modernity as a face of improvement we tend to forget the marginality created by you know uh, the the same process that's what i try to argue here that you know the port of cochin was an excellent harbor produced by a british engineer but the same process produced massive massive level of marginalization peripheries and dispossession so that's the history if that's the history i doubt whether we can consider colonialism colonial modernity as a stage of uh, you know historical you know our uh, um, you know evolutionary you know stage uh, in uh, you know humanity's march towards progress that i doubt you know that's the modernity for me is largely a, a reavatar of modernization theory only <laughs> earlier 
I mean, if we don't approach it very carefully. Yeah, I mean, not as a stage of uh, human progress. Hmm. Uh, next query is from Jinu GV. Does the term dialectical process in urbanization be compared to Marx's dialectical theory? Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, it's coming from um, the way I use the dialectics of urbanization is clearly coming from Marx's own idea of uh, dialectics of use value and exchange value. Uh, that is, that's the uh, that's a connection here, uh, because you know, uh, there that's a political question as well. How do we understand urban? Should we understand urban as a use value of nature, or should we understand urban as an exchange value? Of commodity, what should be you know? Is it city for people or is it a city? Should we consider city as a space for people or is it a space to make more profit and more and more profit? That's a political question. That's the central central concern for our generation of urban historian, right? Especially neoliberal, the massive uh, dispossession, and you know. Uh, you know, happen in this uh, cities all around uh, the world. That include Cochin as well. If you remember, well, well, our bottom struggle. You know, that's the. Yeah. Dr. Vinita Menon has a follow-up from her query earlier. Query, I believe. In the social impact assessment, how are these issues addressed these days? Her earlier query was on public good and common property as mm -hmm. being conceptually distinguished in urban theories. Um, I think I'm not the right person to answer the contemporary, you know, <laughs> urban policy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Joseph has an next query. Can we look into the counter mappings apart from those developed by regional elite to this urbanization? Rather than the state sponsored restructuring, how urbanization was mapped at a more local context? Well, I mean, that need to be elaborated. So here, in my analysis, uh, uh, I consider urban as a multi-authored uh, you know, uh, uh, reality or condition. So I don't exclude uh, um, local actors and networks and commodities. Uh, so we didn't have time to discuss otherwise. You know, for instance, uh, you know, when you study Kochi's uh, history, it's, in, you know, uh, important and integral to examine you know, the merchants of Kotem and their uh, you know the their interventions you know their uh, involvement and we cannot study history of question without uh, understanding the, you know the interventions made by um, you know rice cultivators of Vembanad you know backwaters or coal cultivators of uh, Trishur also played a crucial role in shaping what we understand as uh, urban as a socio-ecological relationship yeah so uh, in that context you know i don't consider local as a condition that exists outside this process it's integral to the process uh, what we discuss yeah. uh, next query is from vijayan joseph you mentioned about dredging at those times can you give some idea on how it was done if manually Lot of labor required, and were fishermen involved in it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Vembanad backwaters had two. I mean, there are many, but uh, two different types of uh, dredging. One is manual dredging by lower caste, uh, you know, agricultural workers, mainly for uh, agricultural purpose to cultivate, uh, you know, for rice uh, paddy cultivation. And this was largely controlled by uh, elite, uh, mostly Syrian Christian and others as well. I mean, and you know, uh, of, uh, rich farmers. The, you know, uh, you know, the Skyle Mughalalists. So they um, they controlled this process, and they employed uh, largely underpaid or unpaid uh, workers. So they had to work day and night. You know to uh, you know, uh, involved in this, uh, you know, engage in this dredging activity. So they create fences with, uh, uh, you know, this with uh, kind of, you know, uh, 
tree trunk or uh, leaves and all and uh, and uh, pebble, pebbles and all and uh, fill those uh, pits but you know uh, so that's a manual activity that would take a lot of time laborious task you know uh, that involved a lot of uh, violent labor control you know mechanisms and everything you know uh, the best example to understand this would be you know pg panikas you know land reclamation work is there and kt ramohan's work is also there tales of rice but uh, cochin when the harbor project was launched they imported initially they imported you know this harbor project was launched soon after the world war 1 so what the british authorities did they imported german war booty dredgers dredging ships initially they had the bucket dredgers that means you know a bucket attached to ship imagine that you know that dredge material would go to that bucket and the ship would go to either outer sea to deposit it there or go to ernakulam for sure to deposit it there and uh, after that uh, uh, the, you know liverpool dockyard produced uh, a dredger for cochin it's called uh, lord willington you know named after the the viceroy of uh, india later governor general of madras in 1920s so uh, it was it was it was a pipe dredger that means the dredger was connected to a pipe suppose you know if uh, if uh, if the dredger is dredging that arimukam you know that uh, sea inlet and the pipe would connect to you know venduruthi island and the ship would ship is extremely you know powerful that it can pump the dredge material to the present day wellington island so that's the way wellington island was reclaimed but at the same time this was not free of uh, local skills the much celebrated modern harbor cochin harbor is uh, is largely local skill to understand the terrain to understand to you know to understand the soil you know how to manage the dredged island you know so this was locally managed the local it was basically massive appropriation of local labor power, you know indigenous labor power and indigenous uh, skills including khalasis the skill of khalasis to work uh, backwater you know water bodies to move heavy material so i would argue the modern harbor cochin harbor was realized with the help of indigenous skills and labor force blessing joseph lastly has the process of dynamic formation of a port city in any way disseminated in land or was it confined to just port areas if it has have you come across sources which point to this mm. can you read that first part rachel once again has the process of dynamic formation of a port city in any way disseminated in land or was it confined to just port areas yeah okay no it was you know moving inside i mean for instance uh, one of the major regulations uh, implemented by the uh, the port authority was to uh, maintain maintain river peria rasities you know uh, because the silting river peria silting can have a major impact on uh, you know cochin harbor even today that's a major concern for uh, uh, the port authority when a flood happened 2018 this was a major concern now there is a need to protect the harbor and uh, protecting the harbor required maintenance of hydraulic specificities maintenance of uh, forest level you know um, uh, you know half the forest cover of eastern uh, sorry that western ghats or sahyadris so these are invisible process but uh, these are going on it's an ongoing process for last to you know 100 years you know uh, for you know the forest cover the conservation politics the state conservation politics was equally influenced by port authorities requirement to maintain ponnani to you know kollam region western ghats as maritime infrastructure zone hydraulic infrastructure zone without periyar there won't you know that uh, you know maintaining that balance of periyar you know existence of port would be kind of you know under threat that's there that's uh, that's an ongoing process even today
we come to our last question, I think. Um, Susan is Shanathan. I notice a paradox that the pepper trade collapses along with the refrigeration and the onset of the First World War and the building of the Kochi port. Am I right? Missionary records seems to define Aleppo as the port where they disembarked in 1820. Mm -hmm. um, uh, rather than, uh, you know, World War One time, rather than kind of, you know, declining um, that spice trade, you know, the loss of European market forced the European merchants and the indigenous merchants to find the subcontinental market. So they, you know, uh, shifted their, you know, trade routes and networks and connections and try to develop a subcontinental market for spices. And uh, yeah, that was there. Then um, obviously after that uh, rubber, post First World War development, you know, massive investment in rubber plantations, rubber plantation in uh, this uh, paper producing area, if not sudden, but a gradual impact on, you know, uh, the, you know, the production of spices, especially this uh, central Kerala region, central Southwest Indian region, massive shift to rubber plantation, was at the cost of other traditional spices and food crops. So that, uh, yeah, that's the, that was there. And uh, yeah, the Cochin, uh, sorry, Alapi port, obviously, the, all these ports, is, you know, port uh, centers uh, along the coast uh, was politically influenced. You know, some point, in, uh, as Pamela Nightingale uh, rightly observed, you know, uh, turn of that British uh, in the early 19th century, you know, Alapi port, you know, dominated the trade activity, export activity. It would be right to call, you know, that early late 19th and sorry, late 18th and early 19th century Alapi, the British Alapi. So that's the level of, uh, but later what happened 19, sorry, 1830s, 1840s and exactly 1850s, the British imperial power lifted their monopoly trade. When monopoly was lifted, British Cochin was a British port and Alapi was Travancore state port. British port became a port without any monopoly trade privileges. But in Travancore and Cochin, a local trader had to sell his pepper, timber, spices to state agent that would go to Alapi port. Right, so therefore, what developed in the 1850s and later, 1840s and later was uh, a smuggling alliance between British merchants in Cochin and the indigenous or the local merchants in Travancore and Cochin. Massive, you know, large scale smuggling of uh, pepper and the tobacco and all these happened. And, you know, that was a major activity there. And that was not a beautiful activity it in, that involved uh, violence, bloodshed. Both Travancore and Cochin state would violently repress attempt to smuggle, you know, across the Vembanad white waters. But uh, obviously, state had limited control. Merchants and, uh, you know, that's where merchants and, uh, you know, lo local traders alliance, you know, the smuggling nexus control began to control trade. So Cochin status as a free trade and uh, you know, uh, Alapi's uh, position as a monopoly port obviously affected Alapi's, uh, you know, you know that, uh, you know, trade uh, privilege. Yeah. So that's the, yeah, there are many aspects, uh, the other aspects, but uh, this is one of the central aspect, political aspect. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Rachel, uh, yes. Rachel, I have to leave right now. Um, okay. My apologies to Dr. Justin. Uh, uh, and thank him, thank him for the for um, his kindness and his uh, um, presentation. Uh, hope to meet him at KCHR functions uh, on other occasions too. I'm sorry, I have to I have to leave now. Uh, that's perfect, sir. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Professor. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining. Um, so, uh, Dr. Justin, before we wind, before I close the session, there was one final query. 
but after that also a few comments and queries have come which we will uh -huh. uh, send to you by by email though uh, yes. we might not be able to take them up now but i'll read out that query which you might want to briefly consider uh mm -hmm. it's again from mg radha krishna let us forget the colonial angle but do we have specific statistics to compare the economic status of the region between pre and post urbanization stages to prove that the marginalization of the peripheries caused by urbanization made matters worse than the pre urban period has not the port been the first major job source to the impoverished people of the region mm -hmm. okay so um yeah that's the yeah that's an important point uh, but at the same time you know uh, who are these port workers in i mean question that's the question we need to ask here they were getting employment after you know as an outcome of their disposition of their uh, livelihood majority of these wala wala uh, fisher folk community and other communities live in question so you know uh, not one uh, kind of you know uh, so all of a sudden or anything but uh, in 100 years or 200 years a long process you know the capital merchant capital and later industrial capital systematically dispossessed the local population of their uh, livelihood of their uh, mode of uh, organizing life i would call them you know urban proletarian class so they were the people you know who were engaged in uh, you know this port activities you know port uh, port work right so uh, and uh, what existed in port of question or related industries you know where you know before this trade union interventions 1960s or later was really a precarious i mean condition you know was precarious condition and all of us know this chapa chapa system that existed in port of cochin you know uh then you know if uh, uh, you know these movements control a day's uh, job if he has uh, you know you know if, if he wants to hire one person or two people or you know, two employees there would be 30 or 40 waiting outside the dockyard so this uh, this was the condition you know that existed in you know the the cochin port so uh, oh yes of course you know this uh, um, we have a lot of narratives uh, that would uh, depict the port of cochin as a site of employment as a site of prosperity you know and uh, and a space of hope of course port of question is a space of hope but uh, whose hope is that was that is the question here yeah thank you so much justin for that uh, very engaging talk and maybe one of the most dynamic discussions we have had in this uh, series uh, i apologize to everyone whose queries or comments i was not we were not able to take up due to lack of time and uh, our next talk in the series next webinar is on the 22nd of october again we have another talk on kochi cities as continuum an embodied cinematic geography of kochi by dr kamal kristi kg invite all of you to be part of it and thank you once again justin thank you thank you, thank you all may i leave yeah, yes please